Good morning. One of my fond, one of my fondest memories as a dad, uh, and as most of you, if not all of you know, I'm, I'm a father of five kids. Lydia and I have five kids, and uh, our kids are growing older now, but uh, I still remember quite well when they were young, just crawling around and few, if any, words. Uh, and, and they're they're spread out by quite by quite a few years, and so we got to watch, you know, one in the toddler age, and then the next one in the toddler age. It was kind of spread out, so I got to see it really five different times with very little overlap. Um, and one of my fondest memories is uh, when I was a younger man, and my kids were young, uh, walking into the kitchen and finding one of my children. Uh, not able to, not able to talk, barely able to walk, uh, had, had climbed into uh, the uh, lowest drawer in our kitchen cabinets, and he would be in there just rustling around and maybe a pot on his head and throwing spoons out or beating the cabinetry with the, uh, the wooden spoons, hopefully the wooden spoons, maybe the metal spoons, just having a having a time, in some, in some ways imitating what he had, he'd seen his mother uh, do there in the kitchen. And what I remember is that, that Lydia, my wife, she would tell me several times during those years, she would tell me, you see what he's doing? She, she would say, uh, that's his job. And she explained to me, like oh, I, perhaps only a mother can, she said, You see, Randy, he's playing, but that's his job. That's the job of a child, to play. It's like their vocation. It's what they do. And it really gave me a a new and an interesting perspective. In particular, I remember this this period where we were young and and poor and living in a rent house, and I was going off to seminary and uh, seminary each day where you study to be a pastor and and I remember I would leave, uh, and our child would be there playing, and, and I would just have this sense of, you know, he's doing what he's called to do right now, and Lydia is a young mom, wife is doing what she's called to, 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 to do right now, and I'm going off to work and to prepare for ministry, and I'm doing, just has this sense of, like everything is right with the world. Uh, my child uh, was playing, but it was his vocation. It's what he did. It was his job. Today we're going to talk about something that is going to be a stretch for you. It's a stretch for me. It's a bridge that you're going to have to, to, to cross, or maybe a hurdle you're going to have to clear, uh, and it is for me as well. Here's, here is a, an ethic, a truth in Scripture, and in particular it is a, an ethic or a truth in the teachings of of the Apostle Paul. It's everywhere. And yet it's a hard sell. And that truth or that ethic goes like this. <clears throat> the job of the Christian is to suffer. As I've studied this passage this week and as I've, I've, I've come to realize it's undeniable it's just there in, in the Apostle Paul's teaching. I've also come to, to realize or just to remember how little we speak of this in the church. It's, 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 it's not a good marketing ploy to say, come, come, come know Jesus and you'll suffer for the rest of your life. Like that's, that's, not a, that's not a marketing strategy by any means. But just as that child in the kitchen with those pots and pans is just made just made to play. That's just his job. That's just how God designed that little child. What we're going to see in today's passage is that the Christians, we are designed and we're called to suffer. Now, thankfully, not for eternity, but for a period of time. So let's jump right into the passage. Um, let me remind you, this is the Apostle Paul writing to a young church, a young church in Colossae, and he wants them, they're, they're young in their faith. I don't mean that they're like 20-somethings. Uh, some of them are. Some of them are old. 
Some of them are Jewish, some of them are Gentile, but they're young in their faith. And they don't really know exactly, like, how am I supposed to be a Christian? Now that I have put my faith in Jesus, I've left pagan, a, a pagan religion in this, in this Roman world. I've left a pagan religion, and now I am following uh, Jesus. What does it mean? How does that look? What am I to do as a Christ follower? And so really the whole book of Colossians is really that. Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 24. That's all we're going to cover today. Verse 24. Um, let me read out loud while you follow along silently. It says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, I'm going to read that again. It's so short. We have the time. Let's read that one more time because it's quite wordy. Let's read it again. Paul says to the church in Colossae, Colossae, Now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So, there are two important statements. Uh, we've, we've broken them up now uh, in the next couple of slides. Two important statements that, that the, the Apostle Paul makes here, and we're just going to camp out on these today. The first statement that he makes is this. Now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. I rejoice. I, I'm thankful for. I, I take joy in how... I am suffering on your behalf, he says. And then the second statement, and this is one that's really controversial, except it's in Scripture, so we, we, have, to, we have to embrace it, but like, what does it mean? And that next statement is this. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. I, it, it, this, this is a very famous verse, and it's an often debated verse. What in the world does Paul mean when he says, in my, in my suffering, I am filling up what lacked or is lacking in Christ's affliction? So, so think on this for a moment before we unpack it. Think on this. Paul says, I, I rejoice in my suffering for the sake of another person. And he says, I am, I am making, making up for something that is lacking. I am making up for something that is lacking. And then I would, I would end this with a question mark. In Christ? There's something lacking in Christ? Before we unpack that, before we unpack what he means by that, uh, I want you to know that, that often when the Apostle Paul speaks of suffering, and he he does speak of it often. Often when he speaks of suffering, he is talking about um, a, a voluntary type of suffering. Some of the suffering that we, that we undergo, it's done to us and, and we have no control over it and it's just bad news that, 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 that we get uh, and then we, we suffer through it. But, but often, not always, but often when Paul talks about suffering. He's talking about a voluntary type of suffering, something you volunteer to do, which leads to the second thing that I want to point out, and that is that often it is a type of suffering that is on behalf of someone else. So you, you volunteer to suffer for someone else's good. And we don't talk about that much in the church, um, but we're going to talk about it today. It's all, over, it's all over Paul's writings. Um, okay, so let's start with the most controversial and perhaps the most misunderstood statement that, that phrase in this famous verse. And that is Paul says, 
I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I am filling up what is lacking. What exactly, what exactly is he talking about? Um, so, so Christ's work, his affliction, was his, his taking on humanity, becoming the God-man, the incarnation of Christ, becoming the God-man, which he is to this day. We've been talking about this over the last several weeks. Jesus is the God-man, fully God, fully man. So the affliction of Christ references his, his, his incarnating himself and then his death, burial, resurrection, the affliction of Christ, his being, his being uh, betrayed by his friends, uh, falsely accused, and dying on the cross. And, and would we say that in any way, in any way, um, did, did that fall short? In any way, is there anything lacking in Christ's work on the cross? And we would say no, absolutely not. There's, there's nothing lacking. Um, Christ accomplished all that was to be accomplished for our salvation when he went to the cross. Like the, our, our, the, the debt that we owe because of our sin uh, is marked paid in full. The penalty is canceled. Uh, more appropriately, we would say that the penalty has been paid rather than merely being canceled. It has been paid in full. And that happened when Jesus went to the cross. Nothing is lacking. Christ accomplished all that, that, that was needed. He, he completed the work. And, and Paul would not disagree with that. I mean, we've studied the entire chapter, first chapter of Colossians now, and he spent the first 23 verses uh, esteeming Christ, speaking of the supremacy of Christ, supr- uh, speaking of his accomplished work on the cross. So the Apostle Paul wouldn't disagree with what I've said, that there is nothing lacking in Christ's work on the cross. So he must mean something else. So we're going to try and determine today, what does he mean when he says, in my suffering, I am filling up what was lacking in Christ's affliction. Now, to help us understand Paul's perspective and what he might be saying in this passage, it, it's, it's helpful that I point out, it's important that I point out that Paul, in all of his writings, <clears throat> he often spoke of two different realities or existences or ages, and both of them are real. Two different realities or, uh, hang on this word, two different ages, the current age and the age to come, the current existence and the existence that will one day come. This age and the age of eternity. So, so in Paul's writing, there is this, there is this temporary, short-term nature to this age, and there is a temporary, short-term nature to our suffering as Christians. So in this age, we suffer. Paul makes that clear. In fact, Jesus made that clear. And we'll look at one of Jesus' statements later on. That that in this age, we suffer. Uh, There's this age, again, Paul often speaks of two ages, and then there is the one day age to come when suffering will be no more. I could take you several places in Scripture, but let's go to Romans chapter 8 and see this. First first of all, verse 18, uh, these are all really famous famous familiar passages, Paul says this, he says, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So he's saying there's this present time, there's a time of suffering and it's bad, but it is not worth even comparing to the future glory when suffering will be no more. Continuing on in this passage, verse 19, he says this, For creation waits in eager expectation 
for the children of God to be revealed. Okay, this is vitally important. If you miss this part, you're not going to understand what I'm preaching today. This is vitally important. There is something here, and in other passages that we're going to look at today, there's something here about evidence of who God's children really are. There's something, there's something in this passage that we're reading right now, Romans, uh, like this kind of separating the sheep from the goats sort of idea that, that somehow suffering is evidence that you are in Christ. Somehow suffering is evidence that you are a child of God. So, so the Apostle Paul might look at, uh, at he, might, he might do this flyover of the, Bahamas, of the Bahamas, and he might find this, this elderly, wealthy couple uh, that have insulated themselves as best they can from all suffering, and, and, and they really, it is just, it is, it is their time now to just take care of themselves, just to enjoy all the fruits of their labor so they have as best they can, because we all know that we can't totally, they have as best they can insulated themselves from all suffering, and Paul doing a flyover would probably say, bummer. Because, because making yourself available for suffering, Paul says, is actually evidence of, 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 of the reality that you are a child of God. Now, I know that's confusing. Let's, let's continue, let's continue uh, on with this passage. Um, so Paul has a very temporary view of suffering. And a view that, that, that somehow that somehow reveals what otherwise might be a secret. Okay, let me say that again. Paul's view of suffering is that it's temporary and, and that it, it, it reveals what, what otherwise might be a secret, and that is who God's children really are. That, that is so foreign to us that it's not how we see suffering. I know that. It's, not, it's maybe not anything that, that you've ever heard preached before. The idea that, that, that you may be less than convinced that, that suffering really does have some good purpose, I, I, I get that. So let's continue. Now in this Romans passage, we're going to back up a couple of verses, and you're going to see how Paul started this statement. Romans 8, verses 16 and 17. We just read 18 and 19. Now, let's, let's back up. Just a bit. Verse 16 says this, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit is speaking to our spirit, giving us confidence, speaking into your heart. The Holy Spirit is giving you confidence that yes, yes, you are a child of God. Much like when I'm up here preaching on a Sunday morning and I say, you are sons and daughters of the living God. And, and, and maybe that brings, as, as your pastor, maybe that brings you a certain measure of confidence and relief. But I'm not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, it says, He testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And, and then verse 17, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If Indeed, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Okay, so what Paul's saying is that as a child of God, you have this rich inheritance for eternity that you are going to, that you are going to live in. That you, it's yours. That's, that's, an, that's the nature of an inheritance. You, you, you are co-heirs with Christ. We don't have time to get into this today, but, but often Jesus is spoken of as not only God, but as a human, our, our, our brother. A different sermon for another time. So, so we are co-heirs with Christ. We, we inherit all that God has for us for eternity. But we also we also are sharing not only in the inheritance that we get 
with Jesus, but we are sharing in his suffering. That, that's what Paul is saying. It's really undeniable. So sharing in the type of suffering that Christ engaged in is evidence that we are children of God. Okay, back to today's passage, uh, all written by the same dude, by, by Paul. I think we have it again, verse 24. Let's read it one more time. It, 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 it. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of, and I haven't explained yet what's lacking in Christ's afflictions, I know, but, but, but get, hang on these last six words or so. Uh, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Okay, so, so he's talking about the lacking, what's lacking in Christ's afflictions, but then he, he, he moves beyond that and he speaks of Christ's body, and now he's speaking metaphorically, and he reminds us what I mean is the church. So there's something lacking in the affliction or the suffering that his body, the church, is experiencing. See, the suffering that Christ endures and, in, and endured on the cross is the suffering that his body endures, the body of Christ being the church. I know this is hard to understand, but, but let, me, let me say it this way. Paul has this incredibly robust understanding of how the church is suffering individually, you as a church member, you, how the church is suffering um, is in essence the body of Christ suffering. So in, in essence, we are taking part in Christ's suffering if in fact we are part of the body. If at every turn you insulate yourself from suffering, Paul would probably say you're not a part of the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, it's inevitable. We will suffer, often voluntarily, often for the sake of another. And when we do that, then it is evidence that we are actually part of the body of Christ, actually partaking in Christ's suffering. So when we suffer for the sake of another person's comfort, what are we doing? We are being exactly like Jesus. Because that's what Jesus did. He suffered for the sake of another's comfort. So when we, when we choose that road, uh, to a lesser degree, obviously, but when we choose that road, we are imitating Christ. When we choose to insulate ourselves from suffering at every turn, we are not imitating Christ. Christ. That's Paul's point. Just as Jesus is known by the, by the path of suffering that he freely, voluntarily chose, so has the Apostle Paul chosen that path. That's what he's saying. And just as Jesus is known by the path of suffering that he freely chose, so is the church to be known by the path of suffering that we are on. That's Paul's point. In fact, I'll go a step further and say, the church is not merely imitating Jesus when we suffer. The church is incorporated into the life in the suffering of Jesus when we suffer on another's behalf. In some mysterious way, we are being incorporated, enveloped into the, the suffering that Christ chose. It's, it's what we do in this current age. It's, it's what children of God do in this current age. That is the, that is the job that is the vocation 
of the church, in a sense, to suffer. It's, 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 it's a mystery. Um, it is a hard sell. In some ways, it feels like a bridge too far. Why? Because the church really, in many ways, hasn't a clue what it means to be the body of Christ. In Philippians 3, the Apostle Paul, this is another one of his letters, in in Philippians 3, the Apostle Paul speaks of sharing, um, some some, some translations say sharing the fellowship of Christ's suffering. Uh, It could also be translated just as sharing uh, the, uh, in his uh, sufferings. Um, Philippians 3, it's kind of a long passage. I looked at it, tried to decide what to leave out. I, didn't, I couldn't leave anything out. So here we go. Philippians 3, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the, surpa- uh, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, for his sake, for Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his Uh, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I mean, there it is again. And it's a mystery, and it's 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 a spiritual matter that somehow when we connect with Christ in suffering, we connect with Christ in glorification. Again, let me repeat. Christ's work, work on the, has, has already been completed, fully accomplished on the cross. In no way does Paul think that his suffering somehow uh, saves him, uh, makes him a Christian, uh, that somehow our suffering it, uh, it finishes the job that Christ left incomplete. In other words, in no way is this message to, to be uh, interpreted to mean I should go home and try harder at my suffering and then Jesus will save me. No, the entire chapter, as I've already said, the entire chapter that we've been studying has been devoted to Christ's finished work on the cross. Christ has saved you. Christ has reconciled you to God all of Paul's New Testament letters speak that, speak, speak to that truth. But somehow, somehow Paul is saying that when he suffers as their pastor, somehow when he suffers, when he suffers on their behalf, he, he saves them from some from, from some other kind of suffering. He, he, he brings them comfort. When he, uh, if we could make it, may, maybe talk about it in, in our era, in our day. Somehow, if I am to suffer on behalf, uh, on your behalf as your pastor, somehow that brings you comfort when, as, when I suffer. And then that is mysteriously me aligning myself, connecting myself with Christ's suffering. So my suffering... Paul would say, my suffering is completing or filling up Christ's suffering, not in the sense that it's making up for a deficiency, but rather it's continuing down the path by way of following Christ's example, joining in his suffering. We are, we, when we suffer, we are, continu- or we are participating, rather, in the continuation of the story of Jesus. The one who suffered on our behalf. The suffering 
servant, the, the lamb who was slain. Second Corinthians verse 1 says this, but if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And when we choose that road voluntarily on another's behalf, we are joining ourselves with Christ. That's what pastors do. Paul develops it, though, beyond pastors and says that is what the body of Christ does for one another. You suffer on a friend's behalf, and in doing so, you show evidence that you are, in fact, a child of of God. Conversely, you avoid suffering, affliction, discomfort at every turn. That is not evidence that you're a child of God. Here's the challenge. I said this earlier, and now I'm going to say it again. Here's the challenge. The church has forgotten what it means to be the body of Christ. We, 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 we haven't a clue what that means. And, and, and apparently that was true 2,000 years ago uh, whenever Paul wrote this because clearly Paul is trying to teach and apply and impress upon the Colossian church and on River Church the, 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 the value, the righteousness, the high calling of voluntary suffering. But, but if the church doesn't get that, because we, we have no clue what it even means to be the body of Christ, we haven't been taught that, or we just haven't really uh, jumped into those deep waters, if we don't, then, then what happens is we make suffering super personal. And what we, what we want is we want a sermon that makes suffering all about me and, and, and perhaps a sermon on three ways to escape suffering or to, to, to inocul inoculate yourself against suffering. But in Paul's writing throughout Scripture, suffering is mysteriously how we join with Christ, how we are becoming the body of Christ. Just a, just a few days ago, and it wasn't, I promise you, it wasn't anyone in this room, but just a few days ago I heard someone say, Oh, man, the, it seems like the more I do for Jesus, the harder life gets. And if you've said that, you, know, you, can, you can join the, join the club because many, many of us have said that. Right? The, the, it just seems like the, the more I do for Jesus, the harder life gets. Well, my first cynical response to that would be that there's a lot of I and me and, and my in that, in that statement, right? I think you hear that in, 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 the, sar in the sarcasm. But um, the other thing I would say to that is that Jesus, he told you that would be the case if you were to follow him. Jesus, while he was still on this earth, he said, in this world you will have trouble. And he said, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He went on and he said, in my, in my father's house are many mansions and I, I go to prepare a place for you. So Paul's speaking of the, this current age and, and the high calling of suffering. And, 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 and the coming age when suffering will be no more. It's not really his teaching at all. It is the teaching of Jesus. All right. Three statements, and then we're going to try and like really super apply this because this is a hard sell, and it's not something we talk about very often. But three statements, first of all. If you are uh, suffering right now, three statements. Number one, Paul thankfully gives us permission to rejoice in our suffering. To say, I'm, I'm thankful for 
Number two, in my righteous suffering, I am partaking in the suffering uh, of Christ. I'm, I'm joining in Christ's suffering. When I, and, and the third statement is, this suffering is clear evidence that I am a child of God, which takes us back to the first, how in the world can you rejoice in suffering? Well, you can rejoice in suffering when you say, number two, uh, according to Paul's teaching, I'm, I'm partaking of this, this suffering that Christ um, that, that, that he experienced on our behalf, and then, and then number three, and I can take heart in the fact that this is evidence that I am a child of God. Now, you may feel like I do at times, and that is, I, I, I feel like, you know, I, I have such, such, such reverence. I have such reverence for those who have come before us and those who, in this current age, are actually um, being being physically persecuted um, in other parts of the world, mostly, um, for their faith. I have such a reverence for them. Uh, therefore, at times I have this really high bar regarding the definition of suffering. So, here's what I want to say. In contrast to the outward suffering going on in perhaps some other country, somewhere else on the globe, in contrast to that suffering that first comes to mind when we consider the word suffering, what I want you to know is that much of the suffering of the Christian is internal, invisible, and certainly voluntary. Sometimes I think we dismiss uh, or minimize private suffering that we undergo as Christians out of respect for the, the direct outward persecution that some Christians sometimes um, undergo, like, some, like a missionary story that you've heard uh, because of their faith. I really see this passage, uh, if this passage is true, which it is, and if this passage is for us, which it is, I mean, if it wasn't, we would just turn to the next page. That's not for us. But, but it is. It is, it is true. This is for us. And, and so in, with that in mind, I really see uh, from this passage that all Christians will suffer in some way for their faith. For a few of us, it will be outwardly. Um, for very few of us, it may be in a, in a, in a, in a different culture, uh, in, a, in a different country. For some of us, it will be inwardly, over the long haul. But I really think from this passage, it's clear that all Christians will suffer in some way for their faith. How do we suffer, you might ask? Um, here's the deal. When you are responsible for another person... Uh, responsible for the church family, the body of Christ, uh, responsible for the church, that will lead to suffering. That will lead to sleepless nights spent praying for another. That will lead to moments of anxiety in which you, you carry the burden of, of another. Suffering will cost you some money that you could have used for fun, but instead you give to help help another's needs. Parents know this. Parents, we, we if you're if you're a parent, um, then then you know that that you it's just it's just part of being a parent. S nights spent sleeplessly praying. Anxious moments where you wish that your kids' uh, burdens could be placed on you and, 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 and the, the freedom and the comfort that you have could be placed on them. Carrying the, the burden, suffering uh, internally um, for your children. Or maybe you've been in, in the position where, where there is, a, probably all of us have at some point, where there's maybe less than enough to eat. And you, you say, you know, I, I'm going to, 
I'm going to lay back and let them go first because I, you, you just take such joy in seeing your kids eat. Parents, you know this. It is evidence of your love when you voluntarily suffer. It says you're a good mom. You're a good dad. Now, being a person of the world, being a person of the, the, the current, the, the, the system of the world that we live in, means that you have the, the total right, the total freedom to be private and, and, and self-oriented and, and, and build a wall around yourself, and you never have to suffer for anyone. That is certainly a choice that you can make, but not so with the body of Christ. To be a follower of Christ requires suffering. Now, I don't think that this is easily understandable. I've already said that. So I, I want to give you some really practical examples, make it really clear, make it plainly obvious how a Christian suffers for his or her faith. And, and maybe when I make it painfully clear, maybe you'll get it. That's, sometimes I need that too. Um, so... And I, I, uh, I don't want to trifle with really precious things. You know what I mean? I don't want to trifle with really precious things. I don't want to speak as though this is lighthearted when it's not. Um, so understand that. Understand my, my heart. Um, so Paul, Paul himself, he'd been, uh, because of his passion for his flock, his, his people, what do we know? We know that he'd been, he'd been snake-bitten, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd gone hungry, he'd gone without, and what do we know? He rejoiced in it. And that's what the Apostle Paul uh, did, and, 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 and that's what pastors do. Pastor Billy, um, on, uh, on Friday night, or on Friday uh, evening, he had, uh, he had, he was with his family, with other young families, some that are churchgoers, some that aren't, and he was interacting, but, but Pastor Billy, with a happy heart, he stepped out, and he got in his car, they, he and Elise went in two different cars, and he, he stepped out, and he got in his car, and he drove down here to lead you guys in a prayer gathering. There's there's this voluntary, like, I could really enjoy, I mean, it's, it's Friday, you know, 5, 5.30, I could really enjoy being with my family, but I'm going to step away because I love the body of Christ, and I'm going to lead them in prayer. Pastors carry emotional weight. Pastors are available. Pastors are willing, <laughs> this is super personal, to be uncomfortable in conversations that other people just aren't, aren't willing to, to, to they're, they're not willing to go there. Um, pastors are willing to be available, to be, to be free to meet in the evenings or whenever it works for you. And, and we do it voluntarily and we, and, and, and it, it is a, it is a, uh, it is, I'll be afflicted for your comfort. I'll be made uncomfortable so that you might be made comfortable. And we do it celebrating, saying, we, in some small way, I am aligning myself with the affliction of Christ. I am continuing the story. I am continuing the legacy. I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't been paid in two months. And we're not going to talk about that other than me to say that is a way in which I'm afflicted for your comfort. The church, you, the body of Christ, you are called to a life of affliction, a, a, a life of voluntary suffering for the sake of the comfort of another. And in so doing, you say, I'm being like Jesus right now. I am aligning myself with the affliction of Christ. I must be a child of God. Hallelujah. I have an inheritance coming. How? Christians set aside money and they give it away. Not just to the church, they give it away to, 
to, to, to people in need in the community. They give it away anonymously. They give it away. And, then, and, and, and let's, let's not be, let's not be uh, cute or naive to say that, oh, well, you know, some people have money to give away and others don't. No, any time a person gives money away, you would say, like, man, I could have had fun with that. I could have added that to the pot. But you say, no, I, I am going to suffer for the sake of another. In the early days of the church, an impoverished church in Macedonia gave generously to a famine-stricken church in Jerusalem. We're not talking about paying your pastor here. We're talking about making sure that the, the people in Jerusalem church could eat, could have dinner. That's how, how famine-stricken they, they, they were. But the Macedonian church that was going to help them out, they were impoverished. That's what it says. 2 Corinthians 8 says this. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor. Another very accurate translation of that word would be uh, impoverished. But they are filled with abundant joy which is overflowed in rich generosity. What's it saying there? What's, what's the whole story? If you read the whole chapter, you would realize just what I said. They're impoverished, and yet they find deep joy in, in sending what little they have over to the Jerusalem church who don't even have enough to eat. What was the secret to the generosity of the poor church in Macedonia? It's found a few verses later in verse 5. It says this. They, the church in Macedonia, who, who were poor, impoverished, they even did more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. What was the secret? First, they gave themselves to the Lord. And then giving themselves to others was, was, was just this natural response. Because it's not natural. It's not normal to say, look, I'll, I, will, I will sacrifice myself on you, for, for, for your behalf or on your behalf uh, for you. That's not natural. But, but, but what this is saying is what is supernatural is they first gave themselves to the Lord and then they were able to say, and I'll serve you. We... We rejoice in our suffering. Why? Because it reveals who the children of God really are. We, we invest, we, not just our money, we invest our time. Time that we could have used elsewhere. We say, no, I, I, I want to. We, we carry one another's grief. I see it every week. I know that you do that. You carry a friend's grief right here in, in this church. Now, I'll say this again as we close. All of, of these are things that we don't take lightly. But they are things that we should rejoice in. They're all signs that this current age is passing away. And, and the kingdom of God is is being ushered in. And we rejoice because, because they are signs. All of the troubles, all of the suffering, they're, they're signs revealing who the people of Jesus Christ truly are. And I'll end with the prayer, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. Would you bow with me and let's pray. God, I thank you for the truth that <clears throat> suffering has a purpose. God, I, I thank you for that truth because we need that. We, we, your children, we need to have a sense that, that the hardships of life are somehow woven into your, your bigger plan, your purposes. We celebrate that, and we celebrate Jesus, the ultimate courageous act of voluntary suffering. 
his work on the cross. We celebrate that today here with the bread and the cup. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.